Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for CLL SA coming to Bournemouth, uh, where it are here originally started from uh, Professor Hamblin. So, because I will be talking about drugs, and according to um, British pharmaceutical industry, industry um, requirements, I have to um, show my disclosures. So, moving on. So, I'll give you basically run through the treatment. Um, and I'll start from uh, basically give you some history. So I will not cover the side effects um, because obviously I've got half an hour to cover. That's uh, going to be very difficult. And the financial implication because I think you as a patient, that's yes, you need to be aware how much those drugs cost. And going to the question we had earlier, um, will there be enough funds? So we've got those drugs thankfully available and uh, hopefully may that remain for a very, very long time yet. So, I'm sorry for putting watch and wait. I would correct my slide now. It should be active monitoring, so I do apologize. But it's difficult not to mention, again, active monitoring. So, um, as you may know, um, Leukemia Care in 2018 launched a watch and worry campaign. And basically, they went out to the patients and did a survey. And they came up through uh, recommendations. And um, obviously, you can read them and align the most important um, things in those recommendations. And myself, as um, I've just I've been I had an honour to be um, elected as the next UK CLL forum from Professor Anna Shu. And hopefully, I can do something about that um, as a, a UK um, CLL forum. And obviously, um, I cannot underestimate how much uh, CLL Support Association has got um, uh, to help you with recommendation number five. So this is straight from the document which Leukemia Care um, issued on the website. So basically, all the people who are on active monitoring, um, there will be, as we said, a rule of thirds. So it will be third of like Kevin, who was treated straight away. Am I right? Um, so not Yes, so pretty throw in CLL terms, that's pretty quick. There will be some of there will be third which will um, not need treatment for many months or years, but there will be third of you who will never need any treatment. And then what is interesting that basically more than fifty three percent of you on active monitoring will have a concern about it and will be worried. And like we've heard from Nora earlier, she would, Nora, that's obviously you here. Sorry, that's in black. Um, you, you can be very concerned and, and cry even if there are screeching um, tube trains. And this is something which I came across January this year. This is a, uh, be a debate which was published in BMJ. Um, basically, should we rename some of those CLLs which never progress into a non-cancer? Obviously, this paper was not about CLL. This was mainly about prostate and breast cancer. And there are many other cancers, skin cancer. Um, many cancers which are in that category. Um, so I would refer you to that, um, um, to that publication. And what I'm hoping maybe in IWCLL we can, uh, we can take this further for CLL. So Ram has already mentioned why, why are we doing the active monitoring? Why we, you've got diagnosis of cancer, let's do something about it. Well, that's why, because treating early does not make any difference whatsoever. So you can see this is a French study, but exactly the same study was done in England as well, um, that treatment, treating people early is not making any difference. So this is one of the survival. Um, I've got, unfortunately, I've got few of these. So basically, any drop, so if everybody would be alive, it would be straight line, okay? Any step down, that means as alive lost. So what that means that basically 50% um, of patients will be still alive here, sorry I can't see in that angle, but about 10 years. So while you wait, 
what can you do? You can either wait for God or you could, we talked about it already, you could keep fit. You could eat well, and we talked extensively at our table about this. Stop smoking and making sure your loved ones um, stop smoking as well, because passive smoking is as bad as active smoking. And prevent infections. And you've you had the whole lecture from Helen earlier, how important it is to make sure we prevent those infections. So why are you doing this? Because being fit is one of the consideration for treatment. So one thing obviously we consider first round the relapsed, but the big decision making is how fit are you? And about 10 years ago, Germans came back with uh, terms defining fitness. So there are go-go's, there are no-go's, and there are slow-go's. And then when to start treatment? So obviously there are symptoms, so we covered that already, so I'm not going to repeat, and signs. But we've got strict criteria. So sometimes I'm being asked, well, why don't you treat me? Well, because I need to follow this guidance. So it is a guidance, but it's done by International World um, CLL, and we are following that. So, of course, this is a this is group of wise men and women um, deciding how things should be done. And that's the whole idea is that that's supposed to be unified across, not only... UK, Europe, but the world. So wherever you are, a CLL patient, you are treated on the same, according to the same guidance. And we have came a long way. So you can see, so this is a very old slide. So you can see in 1990s, the survival wasn't great. So again, so the way to read that slide, so in 10 years, only in 1990s, only about 20% of patients were still alive. When you look at that now, that's pretty abysmal. In 2000s, bar got raised. This is obviously immunotherapy, but we can do even better. So post-2014, that bar has gone up. But we're still, we're still losing patients, so we've got still some work to do. And this is evolution of treatment. So it's astounding that my predecessor, Professor Ossier, when we're chatting sometimes in my office, he said, well, you've got loads of decisions to make because in my days it was chlorambucil or chlorambucil, maybe some that bit of a prednisone. So you can see there's a huge paucity of treatment not that long ago. And obviously, um, 2014, since 2014, we've seen huge plethora of um, new treatments. So I'll cover that old and the new treatments. So let's start from old and ugly and truly shady past of chemotherapy. Well, it all started with the mustard gas. So the mustard gas was first synthesized by Desperts in 1822 and not so controlled clinical trials were done in 1919. Well, look, well, that was actually published in 1919. So some of those poor soldiers died because the bone marrow was completely wiped out. And the description, you can see it, ta it takes decades for anything to happen. So the description actually of mustard gas, gas was done in 1860. And it took till 1955 for... Um, Professor Galton to actually use it in lymphoid malignancy. So I know you can't read that, but there are a handful of CLL patients there as well. So these are beginnings of chlorambucil. And we're still using chlorambucil. And in certain group of population, it's still a good treatment. Fludarabine. So fludarabine was actually introduced in 1980s. Again, synthesized in 1968 and led to FDA approval in 1991. So it was inspired by a patient with severe combined immunodeficiency because basically what fludarabine does leads to um, problems with adenosine deaminase. And it's an extremely potent drug. 
uh, and can be only used in a very fit patients. And as I said, he's got that has got significant toxicity and long term side effects. So moving swiftly on, we've got monoclonal antibodies. So the idea of monoclonal antibodies started with Cesar Milstein and he published in 1975 and that's truly revolutionized all cancers. So basically mouse gets injected with antigen and that um, then we harvest plasma cells. Plasma cells are the cells which are able to produce antibodies. So you're making them like a cancer which you, f you fuse them with tumor cells, so basically they never die, and they, they can pr pr uh, produce a monoclonal antibody. So I've got um, educational prompts from my uh, little person in the house, so she allowed me to bring it. So this is a CLL cell. So why monoclonal antibody works? Because CLL cells has got few proteins. So let's just say the blue one is a CD20. It's just one of the many, many, many uh, proteins which we found it's effective. And then, do you remember the mouse produced an antibody? So this is an antibody. Antibody finds that hat on the CLL cells and then leads to destruction. So this is how um, the antibody works. And then we've got few antibodies currently in the practice. We've got rituximab, we've got ofatumumab. The, the difference between them two is the bit of CD20 they recognize. Okay, it's still CD20, but it's different, different, different side of it. Obinotuzumab, the, the clever bit of, uh, with obinotuzumab it's again CD20, so same, sorry, so same idea. The difference is that this bit of the antibody got glycoengineered and one of the glucoses was removed and made the CD20 far more efficient than the predecessors. And then we've got CAMPAF, which Helen mentioned. So this would be, set, let's say, yellow bit on the CLL cells. We used to use CAMPAF quite a lot, but basically it completely now disappeared from CLL repertoire. So it's kind of interesting uh, drug, and now it's being used for um, in MS um, in MS patients. So of course we like combining things. So we combined. Uh, chemotherapy with monoclonal antibodies, which is, which is chemoimmunotherapy. And basically, this is a sledgehammer approach. You kill everything. So the whole idea of chemoimmunotherapy is that it kills fast dividing cells. So in high-grade lymphomas, it's very effective because basically it preferentially will kill those fast dividing cells, which are lymphoma cells, and also will affect normal cells in the body. So especially fast dividing ones. And which are fast dividing cells? The hair cells, the mucosa. So people do get um, mouth ulcers, they lose, they lose the hair, um, and of course, it affects the bone marrow, so people can, uh, can become anemic, low, low platelets, low neutrophils. The problem with CLL, it does work on CLL, but the proliferation of CLL is not great. It's only a few percentages. So that's why chemoimmunotherapy does work, but not as well as we would like. So what's available at the moment? So chemotherapy we still use, and we've heard the story of Matt, who obviously used it as a first line. So we do still use as a first line treatment, and especially in non-P53 deleted or mutated patients. And we've heard um, about P53 problems um, in RAM and LARA, and I will have a few slides to explain um, why we don't give it to patients with P53 problem. And FCR is still a very good treatment. And this is Susan O'Brien, who is basically um, um, 
the amazing the CLL doctor working in, in Houston. Um, this is actually the American data showing 16 years follow-up. And you can see that the, the patient, um, had some, some of the patient with mutated V genes, more than 60% of them will be still alive. So in some group, it can be curative. 16 years is a long time. So moving on to chemotherapy 53, why we don't like using chemotherapy P53. When we use chemotherapy, so we, I'm using chemotherapy on, on that cell. That cell has got P53 inside, which as soon as that cell is damaged, P53 will make it to be completely destroyed and killed and removed from the body. So it leads to cell death. If there is no P53 activation, that damaged cell, that rogue cell will continue to li live and cause further problems. So that's why we, ne we need new agent. So let's just say P53 is a policeman policemen within a cell, which basically will monitor those cells um, and, and be a checkpoint um, for damage. So in my diagram, the red would be lack of policemen within that cell, and yellow is the with functioning P53. So we're giving patient uh, chemotherapy, this is the population of cells. So normally CLL is not, it's not just one CLL cell. That when you look at, when we, we, if you could look at CLL really properly with flow cytometry, you'll find that there is a mixture of different CLLs. Um, so there will be red ones with P53 deletion, probably at the level you can't really detect. And there will be other CLLs um, which are less, which are a bit more benign. So when you give chemotherapy, this is what happens. Chemotherapy will destroy all the yellows, and the, red, the reds will obviously won't be destroyed because they don't have a P53 to tell them, you must die. They won't die. They continue living. So the new treatment is a bit of a, instead of sledgehammer approach, it's a bit of a SAS approach. So... Let's go with my soft toy again. So you've seen that mono, okay, that monoclonal antibody, and you probably realize that the same shape is a BCR receptor. It's an immunoglobulin stuck on the cell, which basically, this is your telephone communication. This is a slide very kindly shared by Dr. McCarthy. So basically, CLL to survive needs that signal constantly. If the CLL doesn't get a signal, it will still float around, but eventually it just will die off. That's why when we give people patients abrutinib, we don't see complete whiteout of destruction of all cells. So how ibrutinib and other um, BCR inhibitors work? So basically, we've got the signal, and signal gets passed down to the nucleus. And ibrutinib is one of those little um, steps where the signal gets passed down and it's blocked. So there are a few others, um, other ibrutinib-like drugs, which I'll talk later. There is idolalisib, which blocks step below. And there, are f there is another one for Saturn MIP as well. So as I mentioned, um, other inhibitors. So this is a structure, molecular structure of, um, of brutan tyrosine kinase. And basically it's blocked as plug in the socket. And I put that together because I, I found it quite fascinating how those new drugs are not really that new, the idea is not that new, how really it came about and why we don't see idolalisib anymore. Um, the idolalisib kind of fallen off the perch um, and we mainly see ibrutinib venetoclax. I will explain about how venetoclax works. It's another um, inhibitor but into another molecule, but just so, the idea of um, 
another immunodeficiency now. Um, so Colonel Brutto described um, a gamma, a gamma globulinemia in 1952. And then, obviously, a structure was, um, a crystal structure was done in 1996. And first patient was given a brutinib in 2009. And we you know 2014 is the important year where they got FDA approval. Idolalisip, as you can see, idolalisip was slightly ahead. So idolalisip was identified back in 1984, 1985. They, they got into the patient um, before ibrutinib and quite a few years before ibrutinib. Um, the problem was here. So in 2016, there was EMA safety report um, that idolalisip led to severe immunodeficiency and some patients died on clinical trial. And that drug was pulled from clinical use for quite some time. Go, looking at venetoclax, you can see venetoclax actually got into clinical trial even er, much earlier than ibrutinib and idolalisip. But again, unfortunately, there were few deaths so what happened there in 2012, um, when um, uh, basically some patients died of tumulysis because th the researchers didn't realize how powerful that drug is. And obviously they didn't have a plan how to treat that. And it was, um, and obviously um, there was an error that happened and um, the trial was stopped. It was restarted, and um, venetoclax is one of the most powerful drugs we can give now as CLL. So again, I do apologize, another survival curve, but really just to show you how good ibrutinib is. So this is combination when to give ibrutinib. So the earlier it's given, the better it works. So you can see here graph for those poor patients who had a more than four lines of therapy. That's a lot of treatment. And probably those four lines of therapy, that will be combination of chemotherapy. And yet they respond. But of course, if you can give them earlier, they respond even better. And although ibrutinib is not currently available upfront in naive patients, the patients who are given upfront, they do even better. As you can see, if there is a flat line, none of those patients are dying here in, on this, um, over this period. And we've got celebrity patients. So Clive James is on CLL. I'm not breaking any patient's confidentiality. Um, this is um, an interview. He did actually interview in the Sunday Times and in Financial Times. He's been diagnosed in, 20, um, uh, in 2015, uh, 2010. Um, he was given chemotherapy. Um, this is his poem. He's written about ibrutinib. Um, I suspect he was given fludarabine because he says a chemo pill and powerful enough to put the kill Bosch on your CLL. It gets in there and gives Sorry, I won't swear. Hell. Five years remission and the beast is back. And then he obviously um, he talks about ibrutinib. And what comes next might not last very long. But let's see what ibrutinib can do to win the war whose battlefield is yours. Ibrutinib, you little cluster bomb of goodness. And Brian mentioned about... Um, the headlines which were made in 2018. So this is a gentleman who his CLL relapsed more than five years after previous treatment. And uh, he was denied ibrutinib because the way um, it was interpreted, although NICE approved ibrutinib, it was interpreted on CDF um, that patient who relapsed um, within two, three years only can be eligible. As he relapsed in more than five years, he wasn't. So it, um, UK CLL Forum had some, um, uh, some, some role in that as well, and this was our response to um, in the Times. And as you know from Brian, the decision was overturned. So venetoclax, another exciting inhibitor, actually probably one of the most exciting drugs we're using at the moment. So again, it's the same idea of plug and socket. So you've got the netoclax, which fits very nicely into BCL2. 
and what BCL2 does. So this is not a molecule on the surface. Now we're going inside the soft toy. So BCL2 is one of the pro-survival proteins. So everything in yourself, as everything in life, is nice balance. So Lara had a, a balance, I've got a seesaw. So ideally, should be a nice balance between survival and cell death. So in cancer, you've got more survival. So in BCL2 especially, there is more, in CLL, there is more BCL2. So um, the, the balance swings into survival. So those cancer cells, cells can survive longer. And there is not enough cell death. So what um, the netoclax does, it blocks BCL2 and basically swings back to cell death. But it does it almost instantly. So hence the tumor license, hence Kevin was locked in, um, in the hospital with, with plenty of fluids um, and very careful monitoring. So that, and that's why those patients died early. Um, so now when we're doing that, when clinical trial, we're ramping up the dose. We're starting from very, very low doses. So this swing does not happen suddenly because if it happens suddenly, it can kill patients. And this, uh, this drug works on patients who relapse of ibrutinib. So these are some studies, as you can see, given to the patient who relapsed of ibrutinib. 20 years ago, we would have absolutely nothing to give them other than going back to chemotherapy. Um, with the netoclax, we can rescue them. And this is a very exciting study, which we, we, obviously, this is not very much your data. Murano study with the netoclax rituximab. And going to David's point about minimal residual disease, so this is our start, I will, I will try to explain you what minimal residual, residual disease means. So the netoclax rituximab not only um, improves um, survival and progression, but also introduces uh, minimal residual disease and this is really exciting as you can see the patients here in blue and you can't see, this is these are patients treated with standard chemotherapy which in this case is bendamastin rituximab your heart you see a smidgen of patients achieving MRD but in venetoclax rituximab you see quite a lot of patients achieving MRD and these are patients who were previously treated these are not upfront, so these are already relapsed patients. So we are very, very excited. And the other important thing is, this is a 24 months of treatment only. This is not ibrutinib forever and ever. This is really limited um, time because it must be quite daunting. Keep taking the tablet over and over and over again for five, six years. So this is truly changing, uh, changing how we're going to treat CLL. So this is, um, again, just showing. Um, so the red line is bendamastin rituximab. So this is progression-free survival. So you can see patients who are, so any, any dive down is patient who are progressed here. Any dive down patient lost life. So you can see the red line is well below the blue one. So venetoclax rituximab is truly amazing. And minimal residual disease, it's now truly a holy grail for CLL now. So we're not just going to be worrying about, are you in remission? This is what we're aiming for. And what does that mean? So when I look down microscope, I go about 10 to minus 2. It depends how many cells uh, I feel like counting. It's quite obviously laborious. So if patient gets to this level, obviously they've got enough time to relapse. But if you can go below 10 to minus 5, well, we don't know because we can't really detect your disease anymore. So obviously the way the tools we're using are clearly not adequate, but it's still pretty, it's good enough because it's either CLL is truly cured 
or it's going to take decades to come back, which is still good enough. And let's hope after venetoclax rituximab, we'll have another plan. At the moment, we don't know what to do. Um, in venetoclax rituximab relapses, you could still have venetoclax, but it's, um, it, but still we need to find another way to treat those relapses. So, let's summarize. So, what's available now? So, standard non-clinical uh, non trial treatment, so fludarabine cyclophosphamide rituximab for upfront, or bendomastin rituximab in slow-go patients, or clinical trial, flare and here are some of my patients who um, are or have been on FLARE. So FLARE will carry on till about June 2020. Um, so it will be a really important study and obviously will take quite a few years for, um, for the data to mature. But in FLARE, we give people FCR, um, but also randomized to ibrutinib and um, the netoglux ibrutinib. So first line and less fit would be chlorambucil obinotuzumab. So this is this exciting antibody w with glyco-engineered um, portion. And then bendanomastin rituximab. And unfortunately, at the moment, um, the clinical trial we had for those patients has just closed um, last week. First line for 17P deleted or P53 mutated patients, uh, we can use ibrutinib. Venetoclax, idelalisib is still there. And for relapse patient, um, ibrutinib, venetoclax rituximab can be used as a second line. I, as I said, idelalisib is there. We, there is a clinical trial, um, which is um, a calibrutinib um, a trial. There is obviously, um, Helen mentioned, allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, but this is um, used less and less. So how do you want to find out if there are any clinical trials? So there is obviously clinicaltrial.gov. You can go there um, and you can uh, tick um, the location. There is a UK site, but most importantly, Gary, who um, can see you, Gary, who co uh, who regularly updates. Um, that list who is on CLL support website. It is a little bit difficult to find, but basically if you go how to treat, it is there. I have found it myself. Um, and basically Gary compiles the list, which is updated after every meeting um, with uh, NCRI CLL subgroup. So what the future holds? So I at some point I would like to give um, give the patients ibrutinib, venetoclax, or venetoclax or rituximab up front, because as you saw um, from that study, um, given earlier, it's more effective, not leaving it to the nth line of treatment. But to to get there, we've got a way to go. So hopefully, um, flare study will change the landscape how we treat CLL. Of, of course, we've got new ibrutinib-like um, tablets, which has got less side effects. Obviously, I have not covered side effects, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm hoping for a better combination, so people are combining those inhibitors and combining VO is venetoclax obinotuzumab, and this is a German CLL14 study, which is very exciting because this is for less fit patients. Um, and we're obviously looking, um, that would be really exciting to hear. Um, I think the next um, announcement is at ASCO. So at the moment it's embargo, so I can't really, can't really tell you um, what they found, but it's bound to be very, um, very effective. And of course, we've got, we're entering the time of fixed duration of treatment. Of course, with ibrutinib alone, that's going to be difficult because ibrutinib does not induce MRD negativity. But with the netoclax or the netoclax combination, it's possible. And rather than going to David's question earlier, rather than keeping you on a fixed time, maybe it would be better to monitor your MRD and stop when we reach um, MRD negativity, at least on more than one occasion. And of course, the, you've, you've heard about 100,000 Genome Project. Um, of, uh, you know, it, it's, it, that has completed, but maybe in future, uh, we'll, be we'll be able to 
have more tailored treatment. I think, obviously, the cost is prohibitive. We don't have that many treatments to choose from, so maybe put that one in the brackets. And as um, Helen mentioned, all the CAR T cells. So CAR T cells are there for CLL. And again, this is another um, example of technique which was first tried in CLL patients. Again, another example that CLL research is, is leading the way in, in cancer. So this is a, and this is a last survival graph, um, of patient who were treated, early patients. So only 30% of CLL patients respond to CAR-T. But what is amazing, you know that flat line is a good, good sign. If you're one of those 30, um, uh, 30 patients, you live for a very long time. So people can respond. So maybe next generation sequencing can find that group of patients we can go for CAR-T. And of course CAR-T hopefully um, you know, at the moment is out of reach for CLL patients unless you want clinical trial. As Helen said, um, it is available for ALL and um, refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. Um, but for future may replace allogeneic stem cell transplantation. But the cost currently um, is prohibitive. It's actually cost more than allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So to finish, I would like to thank Olga, Sarah, for putting things together and all CLL Support Association, especially coming to Bournemouth. Um, to all my patients, patiently waiting in the clinic room and sometimes waiting for quite some time till I catch up. Um, backs up who helping um, recovering post chemotherapy so um, patient can have can be referred for six weeks free fitness um, regime gentle regime uh, and use um, the facilities and our local sports center and Western Cancer Trust who obviously if there are um, if some patients require support I send them there thank you very much And, and you're still on it. Yes. So idelalisib is a good drug. And I think it's important that um, we keep it on Cancer Drug Fund. Um, because obviously, if some, there are patients who cannot tolerate abrutinib um, and just gives another option. It's, it's good to be always one drug ahead and have something in a backup. So yes, idelalisib is still on Cancer Drug Fund. So yes, it can be prescribed. Of course, abrutinib um, is being given to most of the patients. Um, but at least, you know, in your case, you've got a backup of two other drugs. So I've got, um, um, I've got some questions on a, a just, just written down. Can you diagnose CLL uh, from blood film test only? Yes, you could. Um, but even if I do see CLL, I would always would like to confirm by flow cytometry. So this is the, the you know, I wouldn't really put, um, put my name down on the blood film to say this is CLL. What I would probably would put, most likely CLL for flow cytometry to confirm. Um, then another question, when do you use radiotherapy for splenomegaly? How big does the spleen have to be? And when do you do splenectomy? So, for CLL, unless uh, Helen um, uh, uh, presented before me, we don't really use splenectomy unless it's refractory ITP, which is related, it can be related to CLL. Um, because there is, why not? Yes, loads of CLLs do present big with big spleens, but basically all the drugs I presented to you, even chlorambucil, will reduce that spleen. So I don't really need to use splenectomy or radiotherapy to reduce spleen. And there is a lot of toxicity with splenic radiotherapy. So I've got to say, I have not had a patient 
who I referred for radiotherapy. Yes, I do have, I think, two patients, uh, which I inherited from many years back, um, who had splenectomy for CLL. Um, so these are usually um, mutated patients, good risk, um, and um, yeah, they seem to be in remission. Um, so, but would I do it now? No, because it's not in IWCLA guidelines, so it would be a no-no thing to do. But do I do it in my clinical practice? Yes, there is only one, one other lymphoma when you do do splenectomy. It's splenic marginal zone lymphoma. But you could try rituximab. Rituximab works well. And the last question, what do you think about vitamin supplements? Well, I've got snake in my pocket. Those supplements are quite expensive if you own them on a regular basis. What I like buying good quality fruit, vegetables, eat well, that's enough. I would save that money because, you know, one big supplement will set you back probably 20, 20 plus pounds. Um, and if you buy it regularly, um, that soon mounts up. So I think good, varied diet it's enough. Um, and the other thing we need to be careful, um, I was chatting to um, uh, our, our ward clerk and she was buying turmeric, except turmeric in a tablet form, which she was uh, getting obviously online. Now, turmeric is fine and you, I'm sure you've heard um, good, you know, good press about turmeric, but what worried me, what was within that turmeric to make absorption better? I haven't got a clue about that chemical and I was a bit suspicious. So basically, I'll continue using turmeric on my salad, but just buy from Sainsbury in spices section. So, and, and there are, you know, Chinese medications which are not, can be quite harmful and not that long ago. I don't know whether you, uh, there is a chap who had, I can't remember now what Chinese medication he had, but he had, well, yeah, I think uh, green tea extract and he ended up in, in liver failure. So, so those things um, are, you know, it's important to check small print and check with your doctor what you're actually taking. Because, of course, some of the chemotherapy, um, vinca alkaloids, it's a plant-based drug. So, yeah, again, I had one of the patients who were taking them as a Chinese medication until I questioned him, so what else do you take? And I was horrified to see that, obviously, his vinca level, vinca dose, vinca alkaloid dose was higher than what I was intending to pres prescribe. So... I, um, if you want to have vitamin supplements, have it, um, but I think a very good balanced diet is enough.